Okay, great. Now I'm gonna admit everyone. Okay. Okay, so all right, I think we're going to go ahead. Um, we might wait just a few more minutes. Uh, as you come in, if you could just turn off your uh, video for those of you who still have it on, we're just going to try to minimize our video so that we can see the wonderful images of Kira. Uh, it does help with. Um, <clears throat> with our ability to do that. Uh, and all right, I think we have just about everyone. I am gonna go ahead and start by giving just a brief little introduction and then handing it over to our uh, director at large. So first of all, welcome. Thank you all for coming tonight to American Tapestry Alliance's speaker series. I am Maggie Leininger. I am the administrative manager of ATA, and I am speaking on behalf of ATA's board president, Shelly Sokolovsky, who regrettably cannot be here as she is teaching tonight. The speaker series is a yearly program that highlights artists working in the field of fiber materials who expand the concept of tapestry or are tapestry adjacent, utilizing materials and processes that may incorporate woven techniques found in tapestries such as wrapping, twining, thread manipulation, woven image making, et cetera. The goal of the speaker series is, oops, sorry about that. The goal of the speaker series is to inspire weavers to think more broadly in terms of materials, techniques, concepts, and forms. For example, what does it mean to utilize digital processes as a part of either the design or the weaving process? How much of the hand must be involved in the making of the work to be considered a tapestry? And how do material selections or technical processes enhance an artist's concept? How are artists incorporating tapestry techniques with other media applications? And how is this being received within the art world of gallery and museum exhibitions? As you listen to tonight's talk, we hope that you are inspired to consider new ways of incorporating techniques and materials into your practice, or at least expanding your conceptual approach to making. In addition to our speaker series, we invite you to join us for our next ambassador program, which will take place on Saturday, April 8th, featuring an artist working outside of traditional approaches uh, to tapestry from around the world. The next featured artist for this program is Megan O'Brien, and she is from she is a Northwest Coast weaver from Canada, from the British Columbia area. For more information about this program and other engaging upcoming events, please check our, out our Facebook and Instagram pages, as well as our website. I am now gonna hand over the rest of the program to John Paul Morabito, our director at large, and he will introduce Kira Dominguez, Holkren, tonight's speaker. Thank you, Maggie, and thank you all for joining us for this very special event tonight. Uh, before we get started, a couple of housekeeping points. So we will not be monitoring the chat throughout this presentation. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions, which we will attend to at the end of the presentation. We also ask that you please turn off your mic and video during the presentation so that we can ensure focus is maintained on the work tonight. So um, I am John Paul Morbido. I use they, them pronouns, and I am the director at large of the American Tapestry Alliance and an assistant professor and head of textiles at Kent State University. It is my pleasure to welcome Peter Dominguez Sulkren to our presentation tonight as our inaugural 
uh, speaker series lecturer. Before we begin, I need to acknowledge that I'm standing upon the traditional territories of several tribal nations. This includes the Erie and the Kaskaskia. While there is no record of a specific settlement on this land, it is near native settlements and further is located along known trails that cross the area well before the arrival of Europeans. Indigenous peoples are the traditional stewards of the lands we occupy. We must ask what we can do to right the wrongs of colonization and support Indigenous sovereignty. We are all on native land. Weaving, as it is taught and discussed within the United States Academy, is inextricably bound to a modernist legacy that looked beyond the Western Hemisphere to develop its vocabularies. Foundational figures such as Annie Albers at Rossback, Sheila Hicks and Lenore Tawney drew upon knowledge on Earth from pre-Columbian, Andean, and Mesoamerican textiles. These textiles are material manifestations of living indigenous epistemologies that continue to persist through colonialism. We must not only acknowledge these originary epistemes, but also consider what it means for us to engage them. Kira Dominguez Holkgren is a United States based artist, weaver, and educator. She studied post colonial theory and literature at Princeton University and performance and fine arts in Rio Negro, Argentina. With an MFA and MA in Studio and Visual Critical Studies from California College of the Arts, their research interests include material and embodied rhetorics, restoring material culture, and weaving as a performative critique of the visual. Using the second generation as a critical position, Dominguez Holkren weaves with the material afterlife of a so-called multiracial family. Chicanakis, Indigenous, Indian, Hollywood, Hawaiian, brown, black. Instead of being passed down, weaving and other textile processes are brought up, resurrected out of family stories and fabrics. Dominguez Holkren builds looms to weave into frayed edges of lost culture and language, traditions, and lives that were strategically cut off in past generations. Her looms, whether digital jacquard, backstrap, floor, post, materialize this presence absence often as large scale check boxes and X marks. Questions about cultural appropriation and code switching, exoticism and performing cultural misrecognitions occupy their practice. Dominguez Holkren has exhibited her work broadly, including shows at the de Young Museum, the Lehman Maupin Gallery, the San Jose Museum of Quilt and Textile and Eleanor Hartward Gallery. The work has received critical attention, including reviews in the New York Times and Architectural Digest. Dominguez Holkren is an assistant professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Please join me in welcoming Kira Dominguez Holkren to us tonight. Thank you. Thank you, John Paul. And thank you to Maggie and the American Tapestry Alliance for having me here this evening. I've been so looking forward to this talk because rarely do I get to speak to an audience whose hands know my language, an audience who knows the experience of warping and winding a shuttle, of spinning and preparing a dye bath, of sitting with a tangled mess of yarn because impatience or friction or your dog got to that skein and now it's in a knot and you are actually willing to spend hours to coax it apart and untangle it because yarn is too precious to waste. I'm hoping you're an audience who knows what it means to keep every bit of yarn because you never know when it might be the exact material or color you need for some future project. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And if you don't mind terribly, I've organized this talk a little like a tapestry rather than a linear progression. I'd like to color hatch theory and practice, ply my classroom and studio work, dovetail portfolio images with family photos and screen grabs from other artists' websites until we have perhaps an heirloom diamond to pass along. I'll point out some techniques as I go, but please feel free to drop any questions in the Q&A or email me about them later. Okay, so weaving. Weaving brings up questions of identity first and foremost for me. Weaving is as much about the loom and the identity and history of the loom as it is about the fabric I'm making. 
weaving is tied to culture, not necessarily the culture I grew up with, but the culture my daughter seen here in this photo has grown up with. How do I, through weaving, call up knowledge, ancestral knowledge, lost stories, a past and a place and a home that this first, second, third generation immigrant sitting in the chair, standing at the loom, feel so far removed from in their graduate student housing in Berkeley, California? Sandra Cisneros, in her novel Caramelo, tells a story about a family through weaving, nodding, really, the fringe of a roboso. I'll talk about the reboso a little bit later, but a reboso is a shawl and one of the symbols of Mexican identity. In Caramelo, characters in later generations struggle with having lost the material knowledge that makes the caramel colored reboso that each generation wraps around themselves in the novel. Where did you learn how to do this? This, I don't know, my hands taught me. It's as if material knowledge came out of nowhere except their own bodies. And I think there's something to that, a knowledge that stays in the hand and stays in the blood. But I also think it's really helpful to have someone else's hands draw the knowledge out and up, out from you. And that was my experience when I was living in Argentina in 2010 to 12. I had always been crafty, mostly quilting and sewing, some weaving, but it was in the hands of a friend, a mentor, who themselves had learned their family story through the loom, that I learned to make robosos and ponchos in hand-spun, warp-faced sheep wool. And then I became a contemporary artist. And all my weaving skills that used to warm and protect the body, the home, were thrown out the window in favor of concept and metaphor and weaving sculptures that may or may not be stand-ins for the body. Consider this work. This work is made up of leftovers, scrap fabrics, jeans headed to the thrift store, surplus yarns from other projects, and salvage building materials from Urbanor, a reuse store in Berkeley. It's made from an excess of material, but it's also made from what's been cut off, cut out, used up. It's made from endings. Endings that are frayed, sharp, twisted, endings that are silken and bright, endings that unravel how to figure out and figure out how to pass and refuse to end, endings that move and endings that forget the end. And this is what the generational story of the immigrant is, if nothing else. A second generation material made from the patterns cut from the cloth that came before. Structurally, these two fabrics are the same, that fabric in the middle and those long brown appendages, but visually they look totally distinct. One was woven on a digital jacquard loom, the other on a treadle floor loom. Maria Josefina Saldana Portillo makes this claim in her book, Indian Given Racial Geographies Across Mexico and the United States, that quote, Chicana Chicano identity is the uncanny incorporation of a lost indigenous heritage. This terribly productive loss renders the cultural identity of Chicana Chicanos unfamiliar to any living Indians in Mexico or in the United States, for this loss appears as mere appropriation or affectation. And a large part of my practice deals with this performance, this appropriation, affectation of identity. Weaving a performance of identity, poking at the names of identities that don't quite line up with the truth of it. Does it make sense like this, like this? There's a restlessness in my work that ironically uses a medium like weaving, which is often described as meditative, as helping a mind go quiet, to instead create a nearly frantic throw of the shuttle again and again building up lines, crossing them, testing something that may or may not be the fabric I can even find myself in. My grandmother was born in LA in the 1920s. She was the embodiment of exotic difference. She was raised in a vaudeville stage family who were cast as native Hawaiians in the movies. Here, her mother Wacky is seen posing on possibly a Hollywood set or vaudeville stage. It was a way that Hollywood was reflecting the US's need to make sense of a history of enslavement, miscegenation, and black and white babies. Hawaii was the space where in between skin and hair, the brown body was fun, exotic, at once not the US and becoming the US. Both the costume and patterned rug in this photograph serve not to authenticate Wacky's identity, but to position her black and white, her brown skin as legible, appealing, safe, and exotic to the viewer. 
who embody the acceptable parts of exotic difference in the US was both a passing privilege and burden for my grandmother, who in the next generation sought to give her children a chance to be in her words, quote, mostly something. This piece, Horizon Lines, is a material trace from my grandmother's story of marrying a Punjabi immigrant, sailing on ships around the world, and having mostly Punjabi children. I wove one of my grandmother's, oops, there we go, Punjabi suits, the white and black fabric seen at the top of this piece, together with one of my own, a blue Punjabi suit that my mother wore and then passed to me. And this is as much a fabric as it is a loom. You'll see some of the tools I used to weave the fabric left in the final piece. It was when I began showing the loom as an artwork rather than a finished fabric that I realized a weaving or any textile process could become an active ongoing construction of bringing together, of bringing identity together, of adding and subtracting material histories, identity constructions, and embodied memory while it builds. Black or Hawaiian, Hindu or Mexican, Indio, Mestizo or Pardo, in at least both your parents are brown, I show my family history as this question mark, an ongoing story of performing racial difference, of not fitting, transgressing, ducking, and refusal ra refusing racial and ethnic checkboxes. This question mark history becomes its own kind of X mark as it moves through shades of brown. I used a slit tapestry technique in weaving this piece, both to break up the continuous lines of brown, but also to leave space for another kind of interaction with this piece off of the loom. I think in a lot of my work, I'm trying to weave in these maximalist possibilities, an accumulation not for the sake of more, but on the off chance that ha hands and threads and voices I thought were lost might find their way in. In I Was India, I use weaving as a way of framing the construction of Indian American identity and how it was put to use in my mother's generation. Images and histories of my mother and her siblings as they represented India, riding on elephants in Disneyland parades in the 1960s, and of my mother, who was part of the 1966 opening ceremonies for It's a Small World Ride at Disneyland, filled the bottom layer of this weaving. But these images are frayed, twisted, mixed together with research and narrative and my own hand at work in the history. I see this reconstruction of my story as a process of weaving generational shame, the embarrassment that comes with the pressures and tensions of approximate assimilations into a larger critique of how race, ethnicity, nation, and culture is constructed and performed in the US. Or as Michelle Obama wrote in response to the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe v. Wade, in this country, our futures are tied together in a delicate tapestry that we each have a hand in making. Too often cynicism or indifference makes us feel like we don't have a say in weaving it, but that couldn't be further from the truth. And here, let me throw in the term identities in practice, a term coming out of ethnography and pedagogy literature. The way I use identity in my work is not about the checkbox or fixed definition, despite probably visualizing checkboxes more than any other symbol. My grandmothers on both sides practiced their identity. One called herself a chameleon and could change her skin color to fit the perceptions of those around her. The other switched between languages at work, at home, in the same sentence. The boxes they checked were built, negotiated, and remained fluid throughout their lifetimes. In this work, I wanted to tie together loose ends and rip apart others, twist and circumnavigate the X mark, the checkbox, the threshold of family stories. How does one generation's story get relived, reenacted in the next generation? How do pieces of inherited stories, the material afterlife in our closets and in our blood get restoried in the next generation? Chicana theorist and author Emma Perez talks about living with and picking up the fragments, the scraps of identity thrown away, devalued, and forgotten to history. Let me focus on this idea of scrapped identity at loose ends, identity in practice around three different projects. The first is CAPTCHA codes, those puzzles that ask you online to determine if you're human or a robot by deciphering and typing out a code. Is that a Q, an H, a D? To me, it feels like a familiar struggle of negotiating definitions of race and ethnicity, 
of trying to parse out generational immigrant stories and living out assimilation narratives. What is this code trying to get me to see? It's only in finding the real letter or number can you prove that you're human, that you're quote, one of us, whoever the us is, usually a platform that is granting or denying you access to a di digital space of connecting with others who have also proved their virtual humanness. But there's also a more universal reality for all of us that we're actively building up AI identities around us through these CAPTCHA codes. We're training the algorithms we rely on as we do searches online or interact on social media. We're helping them know their identity when we check all the squares with buses or traffic lights. In this piece, I weave Loki's words from the Marvel TV show together with internet questions and statements about humanness. We can't tell if you're a human or a bot. I'm not a robot. But what if I was a robot and I didn't know it? And do a lot of people not know if they're robots? Donna Haraway, in her book, Staying with the Trouble, speaks to a need to live with interdependence with collective co-species identities together with robot kin and kind. And I like the jacquard weaving process for that reason. The way I use it, I create patterns first on graph paper with pencil, shading in each box. I then translate it to Photoshop and turn it into a bitmap file of black and white pixels. I then recolor those black and white pixels spontaneously through my body at the loom as I grab different materials and colors to lay into the warp. Afterwards, I cut the fabric, I cut into the fabric and cut it apart, rearrange and sew both by hand and on an electric sewing machine. How does the material afterlife of digital questions, of living with bots, of screenshots work in these pieces? Where is the original, the real, and where is the copy, the translation? And is there a generational loss or gain through reconstituting this provisional border of the checkbox, through weaving it, sewing it, cutting into it? In other words, through a multi-step interaction with the fabric, I'm hoping not just to create a border or box, but a starting point that I can step out from using one formulation of my identity as a robot human to move forwards and backwards along generation material lines and lives. Okay, so basically digital identity that becomes obsolete even as I speak, but that is making us who we are. It's leaving an afterlife, a material afterlife that informs the next generation of technology and in our case, weavers of fabric, of heirlooms. I'm leaving bits of weaving all over the globe at this point. And that for me is a generational story. Let me show you the next identities in practice project formed not on the continuum or in the tension of robot human interaction, but in the interaction of my own family archives. This is a Kira anti delipi interaction by way of my grandmother. My grandma traveled on ships all over the world. The possessions that she could fit in steamer trunks and carry with her became coveted tactile memories that she would unpack and talk about anytime I was with her. Two of these fabrics, called pukaris or salus, were embroidered by my great aunt Dalipkor, probably in the early to mid 1920s, when she was 13 and living in Jandiala, India. Pukaris, meaning flower shaped, is the embroidery technique typical of Punjab in northern India and Pakistan. Now, there are many things I could say about my aunt Dalipi's work, but for today, I'd like to point out two things about this fabric. The first was her decision to stitch her name and biographical details into the border of this cloth. I have yet to find another example of a pulkari where a message is inscribed into the border. What was the motivation to take a traditional generational practice and change it? Was she signing the fabric, ensuring like a journal entry left in the cloth, this work would be read not just as a symbol of Punjabi material culture, but a textile documenting and materializing her, her design decisions? and this embroidery is a reflection of her, but it's also a reflection of a pivotal moment in post-colonial history. Pulkari embroidery is done in silk imported primarily from China onto brown khadi cloth, the hand-spun, hand-woven cotton that was becoming a marker for Gandhi's revolution and Indian independence, happening at the same moment Auntie Dalipi is embroidering this cloth. Did she know the history she was intersecting or embodying? Perhaps. But rather than reading this as a fixed marker or symbol of Indian material culture at the time of the revolution, how instead does this become one girl's journal, vision, portal, opening up to a future generation? I was here. I'm still here. 
These stitches mark her decision to change and challenge the fabric she was intersecting, which is the second thing I'd like to focus on in Auntie Delipi's work. This pieced together nature of that brown underlying kadi cloth and the colorful stitch patterns in Pukhari fabric. In my studio of practice, I explored this piecing together of cloth and pattern through zooming in on that two inch by two inch pattern Auntie Delipi created in millimeters. Rather than stitching, I warped these stitches in oversized motions caught on frame bars held by climbing gym ropes and cam straps. I wanted to think through what embroidery does, finding the holes created at the intersections in a fabric and moving counter perpendicularly through those intersections. Finding space in a fabric that never assumed it would have to hold another story, another material, a future generational story and interaction. While appearing to be whole, a rose is actually eight weavings woven together, similar to the construction of the brown kadi cloth onto which my aunt embroidered. Kadi too is woven in parts in panels that are then stitched together. Like Pukhari embroidery, the colorful blocks of weaving done in a rose are covering over an equal amount of brown woven fabric. If you were to turn this piece around, anywhere you see color, it would be brown. And here you can see the plain kadi cloth with only the barest hint of stitched silk from the Pukhari embroidery. The relationship between the material afterlife of the Pukhari fabric and how I am now intersecting it, living through it and embellishing it has become a guiding metaphor for my art practice. What is my backing Kadi fabric, the cultural historical fabric that I in this generation am leaving for a future generation to once again intersect? In some of my recent studio work, I've been using polar coordinate equations, lines that go in opposite directions at specified angles and distances from any given center point that my son rendered in the open source platform Desmos. While I don't quite understand the way my son was using these equations, equations in his calculus class, I can't help but look at them and see the way my great aunt was stitching around a single point on the kadi cloth to create the embroidered Pukhari flowers. And now in the next generation, the afterlife of these material stitches show up in the polar coordinate roses my son is creating. I can feel into this tension of now becoming a center point for multi-directional generations, my great aunt to my son back to my great aunt, moving me, shaping my identity through their lifelines. Another way to talk about this is the structure of a basket or a nest. This piece isn't built from any family fab any family fabrics. Rather, all the material in this work was left over from other projects. It's made from yarns that were kept out of other pieces, usually because of the color. The yarn was too pink or purple, the wrong shade of brown. It's an interesting metaphor in retrospect for my dad's family, who like many Mexican migrant urban poor families had a complicated relationship with, with passing and camouflaging identity. I wove colita de rana as a family tree, a chimeric combination of roots, trunk, branches, and nests weaving into one another. Following the logic of a basket, I began with a one inch ring woven with long silks, let me go back, wefts radiating outward like spokes or splints. I kept adding warp in concentric circles as I went, creating what I thought of as rings on a tree. But this is also a story of five siblings and a small five-arm rosary that I made for my grandma, who in the last few years of her life suffered from dementia. Taking each arm on the rosary in turn, guided by my dad, she could touch and remember the family she was connected to. Sana sana, colita de rana. It's a children's song for healing, for scraped knees, not old age, but it's a song woven through the generations of our family. I see it as my job not to lose the intangible pieces of identity if I can help it. As the weaver, I create fabric to capture the dust that falls out of memories and written documentation, to let family stories settle into the cloth and be passed along with the material, a song turned artifact, a material turned identity in practice. It's what black feminist scholar Alexis Pauline Gums calls, quote, visionary daughtering.
The idea of collecting the fabrics, fat fragments of history and weaving the immaterial pieces of family story into something that draws out new knowledge in ourselves and new understandings of our position to the world and to one another, turns our identities into identities in practice, is also something I try to give my students. In early 2020, Facebook commissioned me to materially explore social networks in their booth at Untitled Art in San Francisco. Using the backstrap loom, I had fairgoers weave in pairs, tensioning the warp off of one another, a strap around each of their hips. What I found was that in making the fabric and weaving together, folks had an experience of being able to see weaving differently. Their experience of the weaving already finished on the wall was changed by weaving themselves. They understood how the weft moves through the warp strands, gets trapped, disappears, only to reappear on the other side of the fabric. What was remarkable was how quickly participants saw their weaving as communicative, as records of thought that they could then be read back. Look what I did there, I kept missing the strand. They could trace the line they added, their decisions, their story in the cloth. By the end of the fair, we had an appendage snaking out and over the far wall of the booth as each person's weaving was woven into the next. And this is what I would like to suggest, that each person's narrative decisions recorded in the structure of the weaving gave them a different way of knowing themselves and their capabilities. They didn't just trace as they looked at the weaving on the wall, but through embodied restoring, people found ways of entering into the fabric, the loom, the terms which I had created and gave to them. As the next generation, they took it and changed it. Here and in the previous slide, you can see students in my collective weaving class, both creating looms and restructuring, restoring that loom through their own collective knowledge, their own identities and practice, changing the ways that I'm showing them how to do it. And this is really what's at stake for me in my art practice. How do I as an artist and educator use textiles as a physical material restoring to change the terms, the narratives across generations, to find and disrupt the contours of flower-shaped, pieced together bits of family history and textile archives. Two, as gender studies scholar Quoley Driscoll argues, unlearn those knowledge systems that are imposed onto our bodies and instead make space for different configurations of self and community to emerge. And one way to do that is by teaching others how to read fabric. Here's the demo bit of the evening. Those diamonds woven into the appendages of that four-way backstrap loom are about to get translated right here on Zoom into a material thinking exercise. Unfortunately, we don't have time to really do this together, but if you'd like to email me, I'll send you this demo that I put together for one of my classes this semester. All right, so you have nine strips of paper running vertical, top to bottom, cut into that white page full of text, and we'll call those strips warp. And we're about to fill the strips with blue paper. We'll call that wet. It's over, under, over, under, and you're going to write your own instructions for this demo. Are you ready? Okay, so the first row, over one, under three, over one, under three, over one. Second row, under three, over three, under three. Do you see it? Third row, under two, over five, under two. Are you catching this rhythm? Fourth row, under one, over three, under one, over three, under one. Fifth row, here's the middle of the diamond, over three, under three, over three. We're about to, as, as rapper Missy Elliott and craft theorist and maker LJ Roberts say, put our thing down, flip it and reverse it. Can you read the cloth backwards? You've woven your own instructions. Follow that diamond back to the beginning. Four three, two, one. In the spirit of diamonds and following things back to the beginning, let me finish this talk by bringing my remarks back to the ways that I see myself reflected in the identity and history of the loom and weaving in contemporary art, particularly Chicana art. This piece, Luz, was inspired by Nahua Mexican model, artist, weaver, and storyteller, Luz Jimenez. She call, she's called the most painted woman in Mexico because from about the 1920s to 1965, she modeled for painters, photographers, sculptors of the Mexican modernist school. Her image is all over Mexico. 
And in the U.S., Diego Rivera's flower vendor or woman with calla lilies are a well-known image of her. The pattern on the right side of this work is made from jacquard woven fabric, woven with many of the names and titles for the pieces for which she modeled. The woven design is patterned after Jimenez's weaving, as seen in Rivera's weaving painting. Jimenez became the symbol, the ideal, the model for Mexican identity after the revolution. Art historian Jean Charlot explains that for his father, Jean Charlot, Jimenez was the woman he saw in all women in Mexico. The woven strips are from exhibition catalogs about Luz Jimenez and the role she played in forming future Mexican identity. Here, Fernando Leal captures her as part of the Zapaistas. She's holding a bowl in the background. But Jimenez had a parallel agenda while becoming this icon. She used her platform to talk about Nahua identity and culture, recording the Nahua language with ethnographers, telling and publishing the stories of Milpa Altas, her village, before and after the revolution in, Span in Spanish and Nahua. In other words, she wasn't only Mexican, she was Nahua. She moved and worked and knew the language of both worlds, which is probably why I'm drawn to her too. Rather than simply embodying the nostalgia that the modernists created for Jimenez, mimicked from Pingre and other 19th century paintings, I would like to claim that Jimenez puts into place a visual vocabulary that her contemporaries and the Chicanex movement in the US later draws from, the loom and the warp strands. They're not nostalgic in Tina Moda Mod Modassi's conception of weaving telephone wires. Here's the first visualization of a world wide web. The reboso, the woven shawl, symbolic of the mestiza draped around the shoulders is not a symbol here of maternity, but unfurled as a flag that for Modati acts as a loom symbolizing individual power rather than labor. And many years later in Consuelo Jimenez Underwood's work, the reboso becomes a place to camouflage identity. It's made for those on the US-Mexico border who don't have time to learn how to work that long hanging fringe into knots and so elect instead to quote, quickly use safety pins, unquote, as Jimenez Underwood says, or use the reboso to camouflage the crossing of the border during the night and day. Rather than nostalgic ideals of identity, the loom and the weaving are appropriated into making strategies, into identities and practice, into making new sense, into making sense of new and changing environments. And this was the strategy I used when I was asked to make a room at the art, New Art Dealers Association show on Governor's Island in 2021. No Dogs Allowed draws on the visual metaphor of the Dutch windmills that used to dot Governor's Island in New York City and the current fans and the ventilation system for the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel that is housed on the island. Thinking through revolutions, I asked who and what have been displaced through these fans and through these systems. This is a question I'm confronted with all the time while weaving. What materials get stuck between the edges of the warp, the vertical strands? What materials get left out? What is permitted entry? What's slipping through? What gets cut off? And what is embraced by the materials and structure around it? The path of weft as it winds through warp is revolving. And then this piece, like many of my pieces, it's a weaving of weavings. There are strips, bands of woven material that are woven together. For the drape of the strips in this piece, I also looked at Lenape or Delaware tribe of Indians bead and fringe work bandolier bag straps. Governor's Island, like the rest of Manhattan, is located on the Lenape homeland. And like most material culture, Delaware Indian beadwork reflects the influences of many different beadwork styles, Choctaw, Cherokee, Seminole, because of the Indian Removal Act of 1830, when the Lenape were forced to Oklahoma with many Indian nations. In Oklahoma, the Lenape or Delaware tribe of Indians continue to practice making beadwork straps that reference this cultural collision with other nations in Oklahoma. This piece is from artist and ex executive director of Lenape Center in Manhattan, Joe Baker. You'll notice in both of these pieces, the fringe at either end of the strap is actually three fabric strips. I read these strips as pieces. Sorry, as pieces coming together into a whole or a whole moving into pieces. Designs change, the patterns split apart, but it's all moving together. 
This, of course, is an academic trespassing that I'm performing, reading metaphors into and onto a cultural practice which I have no personal relationship to. But maybe part of my practice is also a cultural acknowledgement, similar to a land acknowledgement, to recognize the textile history into which I weave. Not sure. Another artist I was thinking about in No Dogs Allowed is feminist Miriam Shapiro and her fans or fimages. So much of what Shapiro, Shapiro's work was doing was troubling definitions of gender, femininity, and women's labor. In Mexican memory, we see her take the same sort of stab at Mexicanness or Mexican nostalgia. Using floral and textile pattern designs, perhaps Shapiro is critiquing or embracing the interplay between Mexican and international exoticism and femininity. But the story is more personal for me. This piece actually begins with my dad and his parents and the so-called Mexican problem in the early 1900s in the American Southwest, which prompted signage and messaging on private and government buildings that read, quote, no dogs or Mexicans allowed. These signs didn't have to come down until the Civil Rights Act of the 1960s, but it, that, but it meant that my dad and his dad remember seeing these signs around them. My Mexican memory is one of being left out of cultural memory, excluded from museums, academia, and other institutions. To be permitted not just entry, but the opportunity to make a weaving a room at not a house on Governor's Island where this piece was installed for my dad feels like, quote, settling a score, closing a wound, end quote. The text itself is actually from current signage from downtown doorways in San Francisco, no dogs allowed except service dogs, and a San Francisco dog rescue website landing page, giving the dogs of Mexico a second chance, both woven on a jacquard loom. Like the history of jacquard weaving and 17th and 18th century revolutionary woven coverlets, my signature and text on No Dogs Allowed shows both mine and the woven textiles origin story, restoried cultural signage and memory. Here is a view of the installation at Not A House. So in sum, through productive loss, as Saldana Portillo claims, the appropriative, effective, terribly productive loss of Chicanex identity, I weave with sari silk from the wrong Indian grandmother in the eagle doesn't fall far from the tree. I weave the United Farm Worker strike symbol, trying to piece together a history or legacy that doesn't quite line up, that leaves gaps in the generational story of migrant work and migrating identities. In the silence between mother tongues was inspired by Sherry Moraga's idea of garbled utterances. So often when I speak about identity, family history, race, I feel like I'm choking up the words, caught in the tension of too many nuances. But when, we, but when telling a story through my body at the loom, through fingers and found materials weaving, all of the stuttering, the garble gets squeezed and teased into patterns and movements that are allowed to keep changing, allowed to hold an identity in practice. Weaving, rather than creating a fixed mark, is a collision in cloth. The knots, tangles, tears, twists, the disorder and reorder, the cut off and loss, this is how the fabric gets made. I can touch it and I can handle that. When I weave, I weave through other weavings, through other hands who guide my own. This whole piece is a loom, not unlike the one I began this presentation with, created from hand carded, hand spun sheep wool and materials I sourced from reuse centers in Berkeley, California. And while I might sound confident about what I do, the tension of doubt is always there while I weave. Am I doing this right? Am I staying in my lane? When does Indian, indigenous, Mexican, US, Hollywood, black, brown, robot code switching go too far with cultural appropriation and ivory tower metaphors? I choose to weave through these questions, leaving them on the loom, as I also propose that maybe instead of, or in addition to staying in lanes, occupying places of brown difference, my identity and practice becomes a place to resist center and margin, those neat categorizations. I try to spin adjacent with multitudinous, crisscrossing, generational, discarded bits of yarn. This was for my grandmothers. Thank you. Should I stop sharing? Thank you so much, Kira. That was incredible. Um, we can uh, we can leave the um, the presentation up if you'd like. If you need to reference anything.
okay. um, during our conversation, but um, I'd like to invite everyone to please add your questions to the Q&A function, and we'll just take them in the order that we receive them. Um, so Kira, again, thank you so much for such a wonderfully generous lecture. Um, it was really fascinating to get to hear you speak about your work. Um, when I was really pleased to hear you speak about um, Consuelo Jimenez Underwood. Um, I, and I really appreciate thinking about her work in connection to yours. And I'd just be curious to hear you speak a little bit about her um, within your own artistic lineage or how you think about your own work in relationship to hers. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that question. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Consuelo Jimenez Underwood, I feel like is like the the forerunner to um to well to all of us doing weaving today um but uh especially um people who are identifying as chicanx um and thinking about border family stories immigrant stories into california um that was her experience crossing the border um and um and what it meant to rate to be raised uh in california and become um an artist later in life um and really only now maybe getting the recognition um that she deserves uh, she, um, th there was a book that recently came out, I recommend it to anyone, uh, Dora Perez uh, edited an anthology about Consuelo Jimenez Underwood. Um, and a lot of what I feel like um, un uh, Jimenez Underwood like allowed for was thinking about textiles sort of expansively um, as these giant sort of sculptural painted installations um, on walls and um, sort of a, a restlessness too with um, not being contented with sort of like just what the loom could provide, but what more sort of other hands in the room with her could provide with the fabric and with the loom. She was, she, I mean, she still is always looking for the, the, um, the most interesting kinds of materials um, and installation kinds of ideas. Uh, it uses a lot of barbed wire um, and other kinds of uh, industrial um, processes in her work. I think sort of her story, um, when I talk to her, it feels like I'm talking to a generation before me um, as far as um, what her experience of immigration was like um, and also uh, her experience in the art world. Um, so, yeah, it's it's interesting. One thing I'll say about the book that just came out about her, it was a little bit like reading kind of like these verbal gymnastics, trying to connect her legacy to a legacy of weaving in the U.S. because it's it's hard to to sort of talk about like Chicanx, Chicana weaving. Like who who does that? Like mo, like it's it's either indigenous and in in, in Indian nation specific, or Mexican, Mexican Indian indigenous specific. Um, but sort of finding um, somebody who's kind of like actively exploring or identifying as Chicana and also being a weaver. Um, there's it's it's really. It's, it's difficult, which is where for me, I'm sort of starting with Luz Jimenez. And then, um, and then after that, it gets to a lot of printmakers, <laughs> a lot of painters who are using woven patterns in their work, um, but, uh, but not necessarily the actual material. And I really appreciate that about Consuelo Jimenez Underwood, that at the same time that so many different artists um, were uh, were making these amazing kinds of painting, like Esther Hernandez and that kind of thing, using the patterns um, of weaving in their work. Jimenez Underwood is actually like materializing those same patterns and using the loom. Well, there's, I mean, there's also a, a material hybridity that that's present that that seems um, both revolutionary and. Um, intuitively exuberant and I, even even beyond content just the the collaging and material that you're both engaged in seems really really relevant and I would imagine that reflects back on uh, certain points about identity I mean is that also present for you too yeah I mean I don't like <laughs> people have feelings about sort of identifying like all Chicanx artists as like using a rasquache kind of sensibility but I feel like so rasquache for people who don't know is like sort of using you making the most out of the least like using the discarded kinds of materials um I mean I think we would talk about it in the U.S. as like a DIY kind of like um uh, yeah, scrappy crafter mentality, but doing it in a way that like rasquache isn't necessarily about craft. It's more about like, like using that like old milk crate as your um, like um, 
your table, your center table, and because that's just like what you have on hand. Um, and so both of us, I think, uh, probably grew up, uh, grew up with or in cultures where we were adopting this kind of like resquache um, sensibility in the work. And so um, it makes sense that like a lot of family stories or like materials that that are found sort of like have to be embedded in into this larger piece to sort of feel like it's reflecting a full life experience and not just kind of one moment. It's hard to isolate maybe uh, individual moments because your identity is always feeling layered on top of one another. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Um, again, call to our audience. We do have uh, time to take your questions. Uh, so please place your questions in the Q&A function and we'll be happy to read through them in the order they come in. And uh, don't be shy. <laughs> we can continue talking about um, weave nerding. Uh, <laughs> It looks like we have some questions in there. Do you oh, see we them? do. Okay. Apologies. I couldn't see them. <laughs> now I can. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, apologies all. Okay. So uh, now that I can access the questions, uh, we have a question here um, from Catherine Cook about um, contact. I don't know if, Kira, if you want to share your contact later with uh, folks, there's a, a request for that. Sure. If you just uh, maybe if you just go to my website, um, uh, Kira Dominguez Holtgren.com, you'll see a contact and you can just email me. Or, um, yeah, if you want to, I don't know, is it fine to share my email over Zoom? I mean, that's that's up to you. <laughs> okay. I'll share my <laughs> Illinois email. That's <laughs> so K I R A D at Illinois.edu. Thank we'll you. let Illinois spam filters deal with it if it becomes a problem. <laughs> okay. Um, here we have a question. Okay. I'll just find something in here. Here from Karen LeBlanc, we have a question. Can you talk a bit more about working with the backstrap looms and the community involvement with people for this project? It's been years and years since I worked on a backstrap loom and I can't imagine more than one weaver. Thank you. Yeah, so um, backstrap weaving uh, generally is woven um, one person at a time, usually tensioned uh, from a post or a fixed point. Um, the making and dressing of a loom, sort of winding that warp, is often done um, between multiple people um, because you, instead of having a warping board, at least in my experience of it, um, you're warping the full length of what you want to weave um, all at once. So it's easier to have somebody like where you have two people sort of standing apart, passing the warp back and forth to one another. Um, and uh, and so the idea for that double backstrap loom was taken from that that sort of seeing that um, warping done um, and wanting to bring that experience of what it means to like move material and tension with one another. Um, the weaving itself is way more complicated than two people. I would never never suggest it for efficiency's sake. Um, it's a great conversation starter because it goes slow. So everyone sort of it literally sort of stretches out the moment of talking about life experience and being surprised by when things don't work out and being able to sort of help one another um, find the sheds, um, find the space uh, to weave. So I've really enjoyed uh, bringing the double backstrap loom um, into spaces, uh, especially when I'm like meeting people at fairs um, or in contexts where galleries, contexts where it's like normally the conversation um, is is fleeting or is a little bit stunted or awkward because maybe people don't quite know what they're looking at when they see weaving on the wall um, or installed in the middle of a gallery space. But then when they can try it themselves, um, it becomes a different experience. Um, and I think for me, because weaving is so relational, like the way that I learned it, the way that I enjoy practicing it um, is with other weavers. Uh, it For me, it makes sense to try to make as many weavers as I can. <laughs> so yeah. Does that answer the question? Great, thank you. Um, we have our next question. Um, thank you so much.
How much do others understand your weaving as revealing and discovering identity? Do you need to discuss for them to understand your pieces? Yeah, that's definitely something that I've wrestled with because um, if it was real contemporary art, then I shouldn't have to say anything, right? It will just show itself for what it is. <laughs> and I, uh, um, I often find that I, uh, I over talk into my pieces, and that's something that um, conceptually, actually, I think I'm, uh, I'm trying to put maybe more, leave more space into the work to do. I, I enjoy using my weaving as these kind of props. Um, to tell family stories, to make present ancestors who have um, like gone into the universe or in the atmosphere and sort of try to like bring them close and listen them in, like listen in. Like I really think that my uh, grandmother would uh, be shaking her head uh, to, to hear me talk about the family history this way. And, uh, and so, yeah, like it's, it's a really indulgent act to be able to be an artist that makes work about your family story and have people willing to listen. Like, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, but no, I don't know. Like people, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about the work too, just on like texture and color and like form and sort of having more kinds of like formal considerations or talking about history. I love talking about like the history of fiber arts and contemporary art and that kind of thing. So yeah, the, the pieces kind of operate differently for me, depending on who the audience is. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so we have here a question. Um, I have this question and one more, and I think there's a few more others in here, but we're gonna have to stop there for time. Um, so, so this question, um, I'm thinking about the way you hung the large pieces with many arms. Each arm is stretched and affixed to the wall. I can see how that is a practical way to display the complex structure. Are there other aspects or contents at play? Example, the last piece shown had eight arms, which in the hanging method reminded me of a spider. With other pieces, I thought hung strong, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. For me, the um, I like to basically put the work back under tension. And so I think a lot about sort of what it means to have not just looms that exist uh, in my own studio practice, but the loom that is the gallery space or the um, the museum space. Like how does something stretch out um, and become get put back under tension um, in the architecture, which it's now living? And so whether that's kind of a metaphorical sort of loom or an actual loom, um, often what happens like in the Nada house piece or the one that the last piece I showed, um, the weaving sort of gets finished in the gallery itself because usually like that piece is 16 feet tall. I don't have a space to set that up. I never actually saw it woven together until I was installing it. So usually when I go to install my work, I tell people it's like I need at least two days ideally because um, I'm going to bring everything in pieces and they're they're sort of woven pieces, but I'm going to reweave actually like in the space. I need like eight hours to do that or something. And so um, with the help of ladders and gravity, I'm uh, I'm setting looms back up then uh, in the places that I go install. Um, and then the other piece of that, it's interesting. I didn't mention this, but like if you noticed with the roboso, especially like the fringe that hangs, like that's a really sort of important moment. Uh, usually in the the drape of the way a scarf or a shawl is woven, the, the fringe kind of marks who made it. Um, like you can see their knotted work and all of that um, in in the fringe. And so for me, the fringe then instead of sort of like draping and 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 um, protecting or marking the body it, in individuality is in some ways like becoming this kind of like restraining device, like attaching it to the wall, stretching device, sort of my marks, my knot in the in the fringe um, is is kind of referencing a body that's a, that's literally in tension uh, with itself. Is it being pulled apart? Is it being supported? Um, and this kind of question mark, I'm not necessarily like wearing that roboso comfortably, if you will. So yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so our final question, um, could you talk about your use of warp face weaving techniques versus weft face or the conceptual aspects, historical or practical? Yeah, great. So um, tapestry weavers usually are doing weft faced weaving, um, putting together a warp on the loom, maybe like 
eight ends per inch, 12 ends per inch, depending on your style. Some, some people space it out a little bit more and then totally covering over the surface, right? So then a lot of tapestry weaving um, becomes about image making um, rather than, uh, than playing with structure. And that's like an, a generalization. I've done tapestry weaving that's absolutely about structure too. Um, a lot of the warp faced weaving I'm doing then is anywhere from like 24 ends to 90 ends per inch, um, depending on the thinness. And I love to like mix materials. So like certain sections might be way more dense than others. And then even if it's like 90 ends per inch, it usually comes through the loom at around like 30. Um, so I'm I'm often taking a lot of strands and, and shoving them through that reed. <laughs> um, the, uh, if it's um, if I'm using any kind of like vertical post or backstrap loom, then the sheds that I'm creating, the the um, the heddles um, are continuous heddles. They're string heddles, and there isn't a reed to separate out the warp. So everything like wants to sort of like line up right next to each other. Um, and so the the like the reason why then it becomes warp faced is there's no way to kind of keep it separated. What like weft faced weaving can't can't really happen very easily on a backstrap loom. Um, and so then as far as like the conceptual consideration of that, I think both like usually what I do is warp or weft based weaving. I rarely sort of do like plain weave or balanced weaving. And the reason for that is I love the metaphor of one material completely obscuring and covering over another. Um, for warp faced weaving, especially, I love the tunnels that are created. Um, when the shed the shed opens up and you're passing through like a thicker material and closing down the shed, it just, it looks to me just like, it's it's so clear the shape of it, of what's being held underneath but that is totally obscured by just thousands of ends that are going on top of it. So that's like a highly technical explanation. I'm sorry for anyone on the conversation who's not a weaver. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much. And um, I believe that brings us to, um, to the end of our presentation. So I want to thank everyone again for joining us this evening. And thank you so, so much, Kira. That was incredibly generous and insightful. And it was such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, John Paul.